next storyteller. This guy, uh, I just feel like, again, is a natural. He had a great story just from the top, and it was just so fun working with, for, with him. I expect great things. Put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, Adam Magazine. <laughs> I am not an athlete. <laughs> All the kids who picked me last for kickball were right. While I learned that Wellington once said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, what I really learned was how to be humiliated on the soccer fields of suburbia. But I'm trying to put that all behind me. Just had a big birthday, just turned 40. Just lost a bunch of weight. And now I'm up at the crack of dawn on a hot summer day in Washington, D.C. on my way to marathon training. These should all be sufficient reasons to do that, to try to run 26.2 miles. But they're not. As you might have guessed, there's a woman involved. <laughs> Molly and I had become pretty close in the previous four or five months but not close enough for my tastes. I had a huge crush on her. I liked her spiky red dyed hair, her cute little nose piercing. She has a kind of sexy, geeky, chic thing that I really like. A misanthropic sense of humor. Everything I want in a woman. <laughs> so one day, I, we're talking at a party and she says that that day she'd run a half marathon. And I realized she'd finished that half marathon before I woke up to start the 5K race that I ran. <laughs> but that was enough for me to say, as we were talking, well, maybe I'll train with you for the marathon this summer. Somehow that vague expression of interest became a commitment to be at her apartment at 5.40 in the morning so we could make our six o'clock training class. Because in Washington, D.C., if you don't start your run at 6 o'clock in the morning, you die. <laughs> it gets a little warm and humid. So here I am. I'm actually early. It's about 5.30. And I wait a few minutes before I call her to tell her that I'm waiting downstairs. And I call her, and there's no answer. So I wait a minute. Try again. No answer. Try your home phone. This time, not her cell phone. Still no answer. And I look up, I can see from my car the bay window of her apartment on the second floor. And there are no signs of life. And time passes, and I realize that if I don't get a move on, it's about 5.45 or so, that I'm not gonna be there at six. And I don't, if I'm gonna go run with this marathon group, I don't wanna be late, because I'll never catch up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little unhappy, in fact, I'm a lot unhappy that Molly doesn't seem to be waking up this morning. It turns out she'd had too much to drink the night before with a friend of hers, a childhood friend named Piper. So uh, yeah, so my morning was ruined by a woman with a name that more suits a cartoon dog. And it wasn't just because I had gotten up early to go join her, get, to pick her up. It was because this was about Molly and me doing it together. For one thing, I f don't really understand why I thought it would impress her to be huffing and puffing miles behind as she was running at the head of the pack and I was all the way in the back, but I did think that that was the case. And for another, I needed her moral support to get up and go meet a bunch of strangers uh, who have are the kind of people who, for whom running 26 miles is something that they just plan on doing. Because um, guys like me, we don't run marathons, and <laughs> guys like me, we don't end up dating women like Molly. So I was faced with the choice. I could go home, go back to bed, uh, which seemed like a good idea. Or I could go on and face potential humiliation. Um, and. Uh, commit to run, getting up at five o'clock every morning for five months, gradually increasing my running total and running a marathon. So I kept going, mostly I think because 
I thought that it would impress Molly to know that I went on without her. So I'm driving down 14th Street in the District of Columbia, and my little Miata, my tiny little convertible, an odd thing happens. It starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I grow bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> my expensive running clothes turn into motley, and my sunscreen turns into grease paint, and I feel like I'm the biggest clown in the circus. And I still can turn around, but I'm still not ready to do it. And I get there, and I get closer, and I see in the distance these beautiful figures in the mist, sort of Peter Jackson's elves. <laughs> not Santa's elves, lovely, beautiful woodland creatures, and beautiful music plays when I look at them. I'm not an elf, I'm more of a hobbit. Uh, six meals a day, and a pipe, and hairy feet. I didn't even count as a dwarf, because I don't have the upper body strength for that. <laughs> and I see them, and I open the door of my car reluctantly, and I walk over, and I'm still thinking, well, maybe I can turn around. And I get there, and I see these strangers, and I see them looking at me, and I say, is this where you go to run a marathon? Thank you. Magazine.